Hi, uh, welcome to the last uh, DSI seminar uh, of the year. Uh, it's been a great first year and we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next year as well. Today, we're very happy to have Justin Grimmer uh, from Stanford, uh, Department of Political Science. Uh, before that, he was a graduate student uh, at Harvard in the government department and under Gary King, who we had uh, earlier uh, this year. And before that, he was an undergrad in math and uh, poli sci. Uh, he's done a lot of work on uh, congressional speech, um, a lot of congressional press records, uh, using text parsing and a lot of other methods. So uh, it's a nice ending to the seminar because it's a good combination of uh, social science and uh, data. Might not be actually big data, but it's large-ish data. <laughs> thank you, Jazz, and thanks everyone for uh, coming out. I'm very excited to talk to you all, and uh, please interrupt me with any questions you may have or, or comments or assertions that I'm crazy. Um, so this is work that's joint with two graduate students uh, in the Department of Communication, so sort of cognizant Department of Political Science, Sean Westwood and Solomon Messing. And what we're trying to understand and trying to explore is how legislators go about getting credit for spending that occurs in their district. And we think this is particularly hard because spending occurs often through an extremely complicated process. And to walk us through this process, I want to introduce to you Pete Visklosky. He's a Democrat uh, representative, member of Congress from Indiana, and here he is in Gary, Indiana, cutting a ribbon on a bike trail. He's here on November 11th, 2011, to uh, introduce this new bike trail or to, to announce the opening of this new bike trail. But this bike trail has a long history. In fact, the million dollar earmark that was secured in order to construct this bike trail was secured in a large omnibus appropriations bill on December 8th, 2004. But this bike trail actually has an even much longer history than that, because in March of 2003, Visklosky announced his ambitious Marquette plan in order to revitalize the, the south of Lake Michigan. So we see this eight-year period over which this spending was secured and then spent, and then finally the end product announced. So we see a similar dynamic here, again, with Pete Visklosky, but he's a bit more south in his district now in Cherville, Indiana. So here he is at a groundbreaking ceremony for a bike trail on April 29th, 2011, so a few months before that bike trail opened in Gary. But th this again has a long complicated history because the grant that was secured to build this bike trail was actually allocated in July of 2007, and at the time the grant was secured to help uh, revitalize Cherville's parks. And so here again we can see another example of, of Visklosky and the complicated expenditure process so here he is in Whiting, Indiana, a blue collar town in his district, and he's cutting the ribbon for a, a very sort of impressive project, a sewers project, the kind of thing that everyone runs to Congress to talk for, uh, runs, uh, uh, runs for Congress to talk about. So this is a $525,000 project, um, $400,000 of which is coming from the Army Corps of Engineers, and another $125,000 is coming from the town. So here we see this mix of the federal and local money. And so in general then, what this is revealing is what we call in this book the representative's problem, or the task that representatives have to, have to figure out in a republic. And so here we have Pete Visklosky. He's a strategic politician. He's working hard to secure re-election. How does he do this? Well, he does things like bring money back to his district, but he also casts roll call votes, and he performs constituency service. So he does all these things in order to cultivate support with his constituents. But he has relatively inattentive constituents. Even the folks who attend his uh, town hall ceremonies can fall asleep, okay? So he has relatively inattentive constituents. And so then the representative's problem is, is the following. How does this strategic representative who's working hard in the institution cultivate support among his relatively inattentive constituents? And the solution that I highlight in my work and that I emphasize in my work is the simple one. Visklosky tells them. Visklosky is going to offer an idealized representation of what he does in Washington in order to inform his constituents and in order to ensure his constituents allocate credit to him. Now this creates the possibilities and so this actually turns the representative's problem into the representative's opportunity because this creates the opportunity for representatives to cultivate support for much more than just the actions they performed or literal expenditures in the district and we'll see examples of this today. And throughout, what I want to highlight is that this is going to complicate accountability. This is going to make it much more difficult for constituents to evaluate the, what it is their representatives actually do, or to evaluate the representatives along dimensions that the normative theorists tell us that they should. 
And so this talk is going to be an example of one way that legislators solve this problem. And Visclosky's ribbon cutting, uh, ribbon cutting gives us a hint. So what, we're going to what I'm going to show in this talk is that legislators receive credit for the money that's spent in their district in so much as that they're able to create an impression of influence over those expenditures. And to see more clearly how this happens, we can go a little bit to the north and the east and look at Susan Collins, a Republican senator from Maine. So Susan Collins works hard to create this impression of influence. So how does she, do, does, how does she go about creating this impression? Well, she breaks ground. She attends a lot of groundbreaking ceremonies, and she does this a lot. She cuts a lot of ribbons. In fact, a lot of ribbons. Here's a ticket, but it's still a ribbon. Okay. She posts to her Facebook page announcing expenditures that are occurring in her district. And she also tweets about expenditures. And perhaps most relevant for this talk is that Susan Collins issues press releases announcing particular expenditures that are occurring in the district or may occur in the future. And subsequently, these press releases get translated into newspaper coverage. And this happens regularly. And so this dynamic, then, is our argument of how legislators receive uh, credit for spending that occurs in their district. Legislators create an impression of influence. That is, strategic legislators go out and claim credit for expenditures, and in turn, constituents allocate credit in response to those credit claiming messages, but do this in a heuristic way. And we'll see that this creates patterns in how credit, claim it, how credit is allocated that's distinct, perhaps, from previous um, theories and expectations. And the result of this process is that legislators obtain a personal vote or support for an incumbent that's not based on partisan ties or ideological alignment, but rather support for the person, for the representative. And so in the book, we show that there's a number of broad implications of this particular process. I'm going to highlight one today. And I'm going to show an implication for representation. And what I'm going to show is that legislators receive credit for the mere report of an action, uh, not just the money that's spent in the district. And in, in response to this receiving credit for mere report of, of the action, legislators regularly claim credit for things that are still far removed from the district or have only a small chance of actually being spent. And so to do this, there's going to be two parts of this. This is the sort of medium data component of my, my project. Uh, so we're going to analyze 170,000 House press releases. So we have essentially every press release uh, from every House office from 2005 to 2010. And I'm going to discuss three broad patterns in this credit claiming behavior. So first, that legislators vary in their association with spending. Some legislators go out and actively create an impression of influence, and that's one of their primary tasks. Others avoid claiming, uh, claiming credit regularly and instead allocate their attention elsewhere. And then I'll show that legislators claim credit broadly. This is not just for expenditures as they happen in the district, but legislators also claim credit for expenditures even as they're just allocated in Congress, so long before they reach the district, and even when those expenditures are allocated by executive um, bureaucracies, that when really the legislator had little influence over that expenditure or securing that expenditure. And further, legislators are claiming credit for relatively small amounts. So legislators rarely claim, regularly, excuse me, not rarely, regularly, claim credit for mere thousands of dollars being spent. And often, uh, in fact, the medium amount that's claimed is about $1.7 million, which is only about $2.86 per constituent. And then in turn, we show the effect of these credit claiming messages with a series of survey experiments. And what I'll show about these experiments, there's a number of interesting patterns, but there's two broad things that we, we like about our experiments. So first is that they're ecologically valid. They're going to replicate how legislators actually go about claiming credit, and they're often externally valid. So we, we make an effort to run these experiments on representative populations, or as, as representative populations as we can find. OK. Any questions so far? Cool. All right. So before moving into the data analysis, I just want to provide a brief situation in the political science literature. So the, the primary theory of how money leads to votes is what we might call the account model. And it's, it's a simple model. It looks like this. There's money leading to votes. Or that the amount that's spent in the district is what causes legislators to have an increase in support. And we have reasons to expect that this may be hard, a hard model for voters to uh, behave in line with. And this is probably because, this is primarily because um, this requires a, a substantial cognitive burden on voters. They have to think hard. They have to be able to track down the spending as it's occurring. They have to be, evaluate, be able to evaluate that spending. Is it a lot or a little? And then attribute part of that spending to the legislator. 
And because this is so hard and voters have such little incentive to do it, it's perhaps not surprising that there's been such uneven evidence for this sort of model of credit allocation. So instead, we build on this model. And instead of just having dollars affecting votes, we argue that it's the impression of influence that leads legislators to receive credit for spending, and that legislators affect these impressions through their credit claiming activity, or their statements that they use to generate a belief that they were responsible for delivering money to the district. Okay, and it need only be a belief. And because constituents lack incentive to evaluate these statements carefully, heuristics are gonna be employed. And in this heuristic evaluation, we'll see that constituents, even if they want more spending, or spending that's more likely to reach the district, they'll struggle to evaluate the, uh, the credit claiming statements in, in line with that um, goal. And that legislators claim credit broadly and long before the expenditure. And the result of this process then is that we see constituents rewarding the mere report of an action, not just the expenditure, and legislators claiming credit for actions, not just expenditures as they occur. Okay. So, so I'm gonna characterize how legislators go about doing this credit claiming, and to do this, we'll analyze 170,000 House press releases. Before we get into the, the sort of the way we'll do this analysis, let's look at some examples. So here's one, it's from Hal Rogers. Um, he's a Republican from Kentucky, and he's announcing that uh, Kentucky's slated to receive $962,500 to protect critical infrastructure, power plants, chemical facilities, stadiums, and other high-risk assets through the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Buffer Zone Protection Program. Okay, so here, Hal Rogers is making clear or clarifying or implying that he's responsible for this. Here's another example of this. So this is from Jim Oberstar, and here he's announcing, claiming credit for money that's allocated to an airport in his district so that it can stay open, so that the planes can be de-iced and snow can be plowed. And here is a credit claiming statement from members of the Oregon, Oregon delegation, and they're announcing $375,000 to combat meth in the district. Okay, so this is just three examples. There's lots of these, obviously. And so in order to measure the rate of credit claiming, we're gonna employ some machine learning techniques. And in particular, what we're gonna use is a weighted ensemble that borrows very heavily from the uh, best named methodology, super learning. Um, so here's the idea. It's gonna be a supervised classification method. So we're gonna triple hand code 800 documents into a categorization scheme we came up with one category is gonna be credit claiming, and we had a series of other categories that aren't really relevant for the talk today, so we'll just think about credit claiming and other stuff for the moment. And then we're going to um, create an ensemble in order to predict, based on these 800 documents, the other press releases. So our ensemble is gonna include a lot of, of sort of, um, of standard or excellent performing supervised learning methods. And to then combine these into an ensemble, we're gonna use weights. And the weights are gonna be determined by their out of sample performance. That is, we'll use cross validation in order to determine the methods that are performing well for the particular task at hand. And the methods that perform better will receive more weight. Um, and so then, once we've generated these weights using our 800, 800 training documents, we'll fit all the models, and then we generate a probability that a document is credit claiming from each one of those models. And then we create an ensemble probability that is a weighted average of those probabilities, where again, the weights are determined by um, the out of sample performance of the methods among our training set. And then we'll classify a press release as credit claiming if its probability is greater than a threshold that we determined uh, at the cross validation stage to optimize uh, a certain measure of accuracy. And the output of this is that all 170,000 press releases will be classified as credit claiming or not. And it's, it's really accurate. So we were able, through also doing feature selection, to obtain an extremely high level of accuracy, 90% accuracy out of sample. So we're pretty excited about that. And, and this, of course, not lost on the people who use super learning, is a method that can be used for, for almost everything. It's great. Um, it slices and it dices. So uh, we're using it as well to look at effect heterogeneity in the experiments that I'm presenting here today. And I'm happy to discuss that with everyone if there's any questions. OK, so what do we find? So here is the distribution of, of uh, credit claiming rates among members of Congress. So here on the horizontal, I have the proportion of press releases in which folks are claiming credit. 
and this is just a density curve. And looking at this, at this density curve and, and some representative uh, legislators, members of Congress, we see that our measures have lots of face validity. So over here we have Dan Burton, so he's a Republican from Indiana. Uh, if you followed politics in the 90s, he's famous for uh, his, his Vince Foster experiments where he was trying to launch bodies um, to see if, if the Clintons did it. Um, and so at the time, in 2008, when he had this low rate of credit claiming, uh, he was facing uh, a very cranky uh, emergency room surgeon as a challenger in a Republican primary. And this uh, cranky emergency room, emergency room surgeon had two major allegations against Burton. So one was that he just kind of liked the camera and that he wasn't really paying attention to Indiana. And that the second was that he wasn't fiscally conservative. Okay, so in response, Burton uh, basically does not engage in credit claiming at all. And at the other end, we have Hal Rogers. So we saw Hal earlier in the talk. He's a Republican from Kentucky. Kentucky. He's now chair of appropriations. And in one National Journal profile, Rogers has been described as a heat-seeking missile for his district in securing funding. OK, so, so one, one thing we can use these measures for is to see how legislators respond to characteristics or pressures that may be occurring at the time in their credit claiming behavior. So one of the more interesting patterns that we describe in the, yes? Sorry, just going back to the slide there, yeah. Why is, uh, I'm just wondering um, why proportion of press releases is the right way to look at this rather than say just the number of press right. releases. So um, the reason that we use proportion is because there is some variance with very high level members of Congress. So like Nancy Pelosi issues a lot of press releases. And so a number of our plots would look odd because you'd have a Nancy Pelosi basically uh, way on the tail end and then everyone else sort of grouped together. So this allows us to capture the, this variation without having to accommodate Nancy Pelosi and all the plots. So that said, the assertions that we'll make about basic relationships or patterns over time are sustained if we use proportions or the counts. So it basically doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm sorry. What constitutes a credit claim? Yeah, this is, this is a great question and, and something that we, we debated a lot when we were coming up with our hand coding. And so the rule is that you have to be um, announcing or saying that you secured an expenditure that's occurring as, as it occurs in the district. So a particularistic district expenditure. Um, and, and that's uh, what constitutes. So, so targeted tax credits would be included in, in credit claiming. OK. So, so this plot's merely intended to show how legislators are responding to various pressure that occurs perhaps uh, over time. And what this shows is the average credit claiming rate among Democrats in gray and Republicans in black over the five years of our study. And so what we noticed initially is that Democrats and Republicans are credit claiming at almost the same rate in 2005. And they actually moved together pretty nicely in 2006 and 2007 as um, uh, 2006 and 2007. Um, and then 2008, we begin to see a little bit of separation with uh, the presidential race. And then we see this mammoth gap emerge when Obama's elected. So Republicans, by the end of our time period, are credit claiming at a rate of about a third of what they were before, where Democrats are claiming credit more often. And so one of the things we demonstrate in our book project is the massive influence of the Tea Party on Republicans' credit claiming strategies. So we see Republicans not only abandoning credit claiming, but they also adopt anti-spending rhetoric. And sometimes some of the biggest appropriators were the ones who made this big flip, who become the biggest critics of government spending. And this reflects one of the patterns that we describe in our book. Legislators, when they're deciding to credit claim, need to consider not only the, the desire to cultivate a personal vote with folks who may otherwise not be attracted to the candidate, such as independents or members of the other party, but legislators also need to cultivate support with their base. And in particular, when your base is, is rallying against government spending or describing it as wasteful, it may be uh, a less than optimal strategy to claim credit for a $30,000 fire department grant that's happening in your district. Okay. So we can also use these credit claiming press releases to look at what legislators claim credit for. But this is going to require another step in the analysis. So we've categorized the press releases. Uh, and we could come up with a richer categorization scheme 
to come up with the types of things that legislators are claiming credit for. But this, our experience was that this pushes our coders really hard and also pushes us hard to come up with the types of things that legislators claim credit for. So instead what we did was we took the credit claiming press releases and we applied latent Dirichlet allocation to those press releases or a topic model. And these topic models discover broad thematic differences across the press releases and also the, the prevalence of those broad thematic differences across the press releases. Okay. And so applying this, we, we find something interesting. So the most prevalent topic is a topic that we might call the requested appropriations topic. And so here's an example from Dave Camp that I, I think is, is particularly revealing. So here he's announcing two and a half million for widening a road. And then look at the, the content in red. He says the bill will now head to the Senate for consideration. Then later in the press release he says, we have two more hurdles to clear to make sure that the money is in the bill when it hits the president's desk a vote in the Senate, and a conference committee vote. Okay, so this is spending long before it's reaching the district. Here's another example from Doc Hastings, where he's talking about money for a, a sub-aquifer, it's like water filtration. Uh, and then, so he's just clarifying here that the money was included in the appropriations bill, and it was just passed out of the committee, so it hadn't even been passed by the full house yet, and he's claiming credit for this expenditure already. The topic models, the themes, also reveal a second broad pattern, and that's the second most discussed topic are about fire department grants. Um, and so this has a particular linguistic structure that's really quite revealing and important. So we can see it here with this press release from Maurice Hinchy. Today announced that the West Endicott Fire Company has been awarded $17,051 uh, to purchase approximately 10 sec sets of protective clothing. Okay, so if we look at this statement, the congressman is never literally claiming credit for this expenditure, merely only implying that, uh, that credit should be allocated. And this is important because uh, we have a, a chapter about this, this sort of process, this sort of uh, grant expenditure, and it's really hard for members of Congress to exercise direct influence over this sort of expenditure. Right? There's not a lot of opportunities to do that. So instead, what, this, what the bureaucrats at this um, what the bureaucrats are doing here is that they're creating these credit claiming opportunities after the fact. And so in order to claim credit for it, the member of Congress is, is implying that credit should be allocated even if they never say it literally. So we see it again here with Visklosky. He announced that, the, announced that the Crown Point Fire Department will receive $16,000 to purchase a portable video system. So legislators are able to not only claim credit long before spending reaches the district, but they're also able to imply that they deserve credit for spending, even if uh, they have little direct influence over those expenditures. And we also see credit claiming about other things that we would expect to see. So the stimulus is another big, broad theme that comes up. So folks are claiming credit for money allocated through the uh, American Recovery Act. And transportation money is another big topic. There's a big highway bill passed in 05, um, and lots of earmarks to claim credit from there. And so the, the last facet of this credit claiming that I want to talk to you about before we, we transition to the experiments is that legislators are claiming credit for small funds, relatively small amounts of money. And so to identify the, the dollar amounts that folks are talking about, we use the named entity recognizer from the Stanford Core NLP library, and we pass that over the press releases, and this allows us to identify the dollar amounts that are being discussed in these press releases. And so this allows us to identify some of the smallest amounts so this is basically the smallest I think we could find. It's from Grace Johnson announced that uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities made a grant to a museum in her district, and the museum will use the $1,000 to support uh, its transportation fare. Okay, so this is a very small amount of money, $1,000. Uh, and in general, this sort of small amount of money is quite prevalent in press releases. Indeed, 19% of credit claiming press releases make reference to an expenditure of $50,000 or less. And, and just to know that we're not cooking the books here, 24% make a reference to an expenditure of $100,000 or less. So there's lots of reference to relatively small amount of money. And we can then examine and ask what's the sort of average amount discussed or the median amount discussed. So the structure of these credit claiming uh, press releases is that they'll often say, we, sec we secured this amount of money, say a million dollars for my district, and this is part of a broader bill, sort of a $50 billion expenditure, say. And so one way to, to 
and the legislator's not claiming credit for the 50 billion, they're claiming credit for that 1 million. So we can look, instead of uh, just at the average, we can look at the median amount of the median amount claimed in each press release. So we take each press release, find the median amount claimed, and then take the median of that, and it's relatively small. It's 1.7 million, or about $2.83 per district resident. So this is a relatively small amount of money that legislators are claiming credit for. Yes? So something I thought you were going to tell us on this slide, and maybe it's just coming, is that uh, legislators you know, go and announce stuff that maybe got passed by the person who was in their district yeah. before and left Congress, and you know, they took over. I'm wondering, if, can you see that in the data you have? So, so I don't have a specific example on this slide. So that the fire department is, comes closest to having the example here because this is something that's done through a competitive process that the legislator is only finding out at the end of the process that the allocation has occurred and really struggle to, struggles to intervene uh, before, that, before that time. And this is actually part of a broader rule across the bureaucracy or a number of agencies and they call it the 72 hour rule. And so we, we have some great minutes from uh, the NIH from HHS, where they, a uh, number of other places where they, the folks are in the meetings trying to clarify to their, uh, the, the other folks, the other bureaucrats, that they need to wait the 72 hours before making an announcement. So um, the, the closest I have to someone announcing something else that someone else secured is at that ribbon cutting where uh, Visclosky was at the very beginning in Gary. And there, because it took so long uh, for the expenditure to occur, um, there was a different mayor, and so there's this mayor, Rudy Clay, who's widely known as, as pretty ineffective and, and probably generally corrupt. Um, and uh, at, the, at the ribbon cutting ceremony, Visklosky says, Rudy Clay, he's, he's a real closer, and, uh, and basically implies that all Clay did was like not get in the way at the end of this, even though Clay got up and gave a really big speech about how this is part of his broader plan. So, so claiming credit for something that someone else secured, I think is, is sort of well within this, this process and something that's feasible. Okay, so, so analyzing these press releases then reveals that legislators are strategic in their credit claiming, and they're claiming credit for much more than just expenditures as they occur, much more than checks as they're cut in the district, but rather legislators are claiming credit for requests and grants that are made um, uh, by executive agencies, and not just things that are earmarked in appropriation bills. And often this credit claiming is about small amounts of money, not really large expenditures. Yes. Uh, this is fascinating. I just had a question about the small, that $1,000 grant. Mm -hmm. First of all, under transportation, which maybe it could be classified under National Endowment of the Humanities grants, um, so the topic modeling doesn't always work so well. But more, more to the point, um, we recently received an NEH grant, and it's not on the huge side, 200K, but all of our legislators um, announced it, because it just seems to be the standard thing to do, even though I've gotten much, much larger grants from the NSF. So I'm kind of wondering, it just seems like that whether they want to or not, they have to announce those grants. So I'm not quite sure it would fall under credit claiming as opposed to just standard procedure, and if they didn't do it, then it would be like a broach a protocol. So I'm wondering if, if mm -hmm. your analysis takes that into account. Definitely. So one of, the, one of the things that we show, and I can show some slides of this effect towards the end, is that legislators are variant in their credit claiming rate. And so one of the implications of your analysis is that, there's, that all legislators should be doing this and we shouldn't see substantial variation across legislators. But that's decidedly not what we see. In fact, we see that legislators who are aligned with their district, who can just make appeals to their partisan base, they credit claim much less often than the folks who need to cultivate this personal vote. So we see some strategic variation in legislators' credit claiming activities. And, and what's more, I I've, haven't I've, heard in interviews that I've done, press secretaries say, oh, we, this was just part of our protocol. It, like we felt like we'd be, we'd be violating the, the terms of our agreement with the agency if we didn't announce this. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right, so we have strategic legislators but then we have these intuitive constituents. So now we're gonna transition and look at how this credit claiming activity affects how constituents allocate credit. 
And why, is it why does it matter that we have these intuitive constituents? Well, because when we're thinking intuitively, all of us, we will find it hard to reason quantitatively. It becomes really hard to do things like incorporate numbers into our thinking, so instead, we'll use heuristics. And um, when we're using these heuristics, again, numerical information will be difficult to incorporate, so instead, we'll tend to, we'll tend to focus on information that's relatively easy to evalu evaluate. And it turns out our brains are pretty well equipped to evaluate actions or things that are being reported. That is, we can readily identify speakers, who's speaking, who's saying something. We can identify what is being claimed, so what's, what's, what's this person saying happened, and we can also evaluate the purported benefits of, the, of what's being claimed. And so this would suggest, just with this very quick summary of cognitive psychology literature, that constituents will evaluate actions that are reported and not the money that's being claimed. Um, and this then provides some context for what legislators are doing. Legislators are claiming credit for these opportunities because they receive credit throughout the appropriations process. Hi. Um, I was wondering if uh, they also, so I, this is sort of part of your explanation for why they claim credit for small amounts. Yeah, the, yes. It doesn't matter how much money you're claiming, you, an action of you know, credit is what's important and the amount of money sort of doesn't matter. Is that, that the idea? That, that's right, yeah. So, so we'll if see. you claim credit for lots of money, you know, you've got to tell the truth. You know, because otherwise the newspaper will get in, then oh, the newspaper gets involved uh -huh. and somebody will keep you honest, you know. I mean, that, I just wonder mm -hmm. about the sort of, you know, what, what keeps them honest in making these reports and in claiming credit or implying credit for things they didn't really necessarily have anything to do with. One of the things that allows them to make these kinds of claims is that nobody's really watching if you're talking about $3,000. So we, we do see, I mean, the grants can get pretty big. They get up to half a million or a million. So that's why it's small, while it's small to the district, it may be enough that, well, and, and so, so we see this announcing behavior pretty regularly with these FAA grants to these really small airports. And so I think there is a general perception that it's a really bad thing to lie if you're a member of Congress. And it's a really, really bad thing to lie if you're a press secretary for a member of Congress. Um, and so I think that there's an anticipation that if this was ever discovered, that it would have a very detrimental effect on a career, or it certainly would be a scandal that could get someone fired. And so I think that there is an anticipation that the, the risk is so bad that that's part of what keeps them honest. Okay. Um, and so then thinking through uh, this point then, this provides some context for why legislators are um, claiming credit for such small amounts of money and, and throughout the process is because they're receiving credit for it. And so we're going to assess this, or I'll demonstrate this pattern with three survey experiments. And the idea with these experiments is that we're going to vary the content of credit claiming messages that are going to allow us to test facets of this argument. And so what I'll show uh, in these three experiments is that legislators receive basically the same reward for requesting that money is spent in the district as the legislator receives when they claim they secured money for the district. Um, I'll show that constituents are responsive to small increases in the dollar amount when that dollar amount is relatively small, but when it's large, there's essentially no effect. And that constituents tend to reward many actions and not um, increased expenditures. Okay, so here, here's our first experiment. So what we're going to do here is we're going to vary the action that's reported and an explicit reference to the dollar amount that's being claimed. And so we have three action conditions. So the first is the most, uh, is the clearest responsibility for actually securing something. Here the legislator will say they secured money for the district. The second condition is a bit more removed. The legislator requested money for the district in this condition. They asked for money to be spent. And the third condition is the farthest removed. In this condition, the legislator merely states his or her intention to request money. They say, I will request money for the district. Okay, then we have two money conditions. So the first money condition will have the legislator refer to a relatively large amount of money, 84 million. And then the second money condition will have the legislator refer to merely requesting or securing support for the district. And then we'll have a control condition where we'll have no press release issued. We'll just push a person right to our questions. Um, this is a, a pretty strong control. It's not close to something like a placebo, but we replicate the patterns that we see here if we include a control condition that is, ha, actually provides information about the legislator without credit claiming. 
Okay, so this is what the, the treatment looks like, our protocol looks like on our servers before we render it to our participants. So here you see we can pipe in the participant's actual senator, so we're using actual senators here. Um, and then we can allocate them or randomize them to the conditions just by, by uh, selecting out the right content from the parentheses and the square brackets. So, uh, and here it's a, a, an expenditure about highway money. So our mechanics are that we recruit about 2,000 folks from a survey sampling international panel. Uh, we randomly select each, for each one of our participants, one of their senators, and then administer the treatment. And then we have that participant continue to the survey. All right. Okay, so one of the questions that we ask our participants is we ask them to evaluate how effective their representative is at delivering money to the district. And so here at the bottom we have the control condition and then we move up the will request requested and secured with the money and support condition for each. And what we see is that there's a general increase in the perceived effectiveness at delivering money to the district. But we struggle to find differences across our treated conditions. That is, while there's a bump across these conditions, there doesn't appear to be a systematic difference across our treated conditions. Or at least the systematic, or the, the differences are small. And so this actually translates over into an overall evaluation of the legislator. We asked our participants to evaluate their legislator on a scale from zero to 100. Zero means quite cold, 100 means quite warm. And so again, we find this general bump in feeling thermometer rating, but we don't find systematic differences across our conditions. And indeed, the condition that appears to have the largest response is the weakest condition, the condition where the legislator is stating that they will request support. Okay, and we can replicate this same pattern with approval ratings. And so we may have two concerns at this point, or many, but two, two may be salient. So the first may be that we lack power to distinguish across these conditions in the treatment conditions, so that we, this is simply an artifact of an underpowered design. Um, And the second is, perhaps our participants aren't paying close enough attention to really parse the content of our treatment, and what we're picking up here is that they've, they've seen some information about their legislator. So this last slide, this last figure from this experiment, would suggest that neither of those are what are explaining this, this outcome. So here we asked our participants, um, how likely is it do you think that your district will receive this money? Is it likely or not likely? And down here we have the proportion who perceive this to be likely. And obviously we can't ask this for the control condition because they never saw an expenditure. But what we find is that the folks in the secured condition where the money is referenced perceive it to be much more likely that their district will receive the money or that about half of them perceive it to be likely than folks in other conditions. And the second highest is the secured support condition. So the folks in these two conditions do appear to be picking up the content of the treatment. They do appear to be seeing that their legislator has secured money. But this is not then translating into an overall evaluation, uh, uh, affecting the overall evaluation of the legislator or perceived effectiveness at delivering money to the district. And so this would suggest then that, that, our, that constituents are rewarding requesting money as much as if the money was secured. Okay? So this, this first experiment then suggests that constituents are responsive to actions. But we may ask just how responsive to money are uh, constituents or our participants in this study. So we may not think that it's just completely flat because intuitive constituents or intuitive people can make some numerical comparisons. For example, if you drive a car, you probably know the average price of gas. We also probably know the average temperature in the area. And so this, this really cool paper by Steve Ansullivan, Mark Meredith, and Eric Snowberg show that some numerical information that's familiar is easy to recall and that folks can, can convey it on a survey. And likewise with dollars, some comparisons are fast and easy. So we all know that $5 is a lot less than a million and that receiving $5 for something would make us much less happy than receiving a million dollars. But it's harder to make a comparison between 100 million and 150 million. So we know that 150 million would be better than 100 million, but it's hard to know how much better, like how many more jobs will this create or how many more wings in our palace would this provide. Um, that's a harder thing to measure than the million to five dollar comparison. So this would suggest that we maybe we'll be more responsive to dollar figures that we're, we're familiar with than extremely large dollar figures. So we're gonna assess this with a dose response study. 
So here's the idea. Uh, we're going to use a fictitious representative here and only here. And then we're going to assign participants to read a credit claiming statement where there's x dollars being claimed, where x is going to be drawn from a uniform distribution. At the bottom, it's $10,000. And at the top, it's $10 million. And then we'll estimate the average feeling thermometer given this treatment uh, with a local linear regression. OK? All right, and so here's what this, this treatment looks like. So here we have the representative. And rather than just say it was fictitious, we said that we redacted the name. Um, and then we also provided information about whether it was a Democrat or Republican. I can talk about what that did. The answer is nothing, um, but if anyone's interested. And then we say that this representative secures then an amount here, and that's where we pipe in the treatment. And then we have this expenditure be about police department, so a police department grant. So the mechanics, again, we use the same 2,000 SSI panelists that we used before. This, of course, makes us concerned about bleed over between the treatments, in particular anchoring. But we don't find any anchoring. It's not that the folks, it, it isn't the case that the folks who received the $84 million treatment before behaved differently on this study. So then we provide our participants the story, and then we administer the survey. Okay. And so here, um, on the horizontal axis, I'm going to place the, the treatment, the millions of dollars announced. And up here, I have uh, a feeling thermometer graph, and I've truncated it so we can look at the differences from 30 to 70. And what we find is that there's a big effect when we increase the amount that's claimed from about 10,000 to 1.4 million. Um, and in fact, this is a, so a 9.3 point increase in the average feeling thermometer rating. Uh, so this is, this is fairly large and fairly responsive. But as we look over the rest of the scale, we find essentially no change at all. So as you increase the, feeling therm uh, increase the amount claimed from 1.4 to 10 million, there is a 0 0.9 point increase in feeling thermometer, but we would fail to um, reject that null. Um, and if you look, there doesn't really appear to be a systematic difference. This isn't a big substantial effect. OK? So, so this study, this, this simple study, then reveals an, an important facet of how credit's allocated. And that's that large increases in the dollar amount that's claimed do not translate into large increases in the credit that legislators receive. Rather, constituents seem to be relatively unresponsive to the large dollar amounts that are claimed. So we may ask in this final study then, how much more responsive are constituents to increases in the number of actions that are reported than the amount of money that's claimed? And from what we've shown before, we have good reason to think that the repeated actions are going to be easier to recall than tallying up the total amount that's claimed over many messages. Because it's going to be easy for folks to identify the broad theme in each one of these messages that they see and to recall that they saw a few or many of these messages than to differentiate how much is claimed in each one of these and, and add those up, sum those together. And so to assess this, we're going to use a two by two design. And so one, one facet of this design, one arm of this design, is going to vary the frequency or the number of messages that we send constituents or participants. So this is going to happen over the course of a series of days. And so in our low frequency condition, we'll send one message to our participants. In the high frequency condition, we'll send five messages. And then we'll have a small award and a large award condition. So in the small award condition, we'll always have the legislator claiming credit for 100 times for a hundredth of the money that the legislator in the large award condition is claiming credit for. Okay, so for example, in the small award low frequency condition, the legislator is claiming credit for 15,000. In the large award low frequency, the legisl legislator is claiming credit for one and a half million. And we maintain this ratio over the five days of our high frequency condition so that there's 100 times more money claimed in the large award high frequency condition than in the uh, small award, high frequency condition, and that there's more money claimed in the large award, low frequency condition than in the um, small award, high frequency condition. OK? All right, so because we're doing this over days, it would have been really uh, costly to run this through a traditional survey firm. So instead, we enroll participants through Amazon.com's Mechanical Turk. Uh, we then collect information from these folks. And then we randomize them to conditions. And part of this information we collect is their nine-digit zip code. So we can place them in, in the individual congressional districts. And then we deliver these messages through email. 
And we're actually able to replicate how legislators are claiming credit in electronic newsletters. And in particular, the folks in this study didn't actually know they were participating in an experiment. We told them that we were researchers at Stanford who were trying to facilitate connections between legislators and their constituents. So we think we also were able to minimize sort of demand effects that could have been salient. So again, this is what these, um, uh, the treatment looks like before we render it, where we pipe in the legislator's last name and also some information about this representative. So to ensure that we're not detecting differences because, uh, because the effect has decayed from our low frequency condition, on the day following the last email, whenever that might be, we ask our respondents to complete a post survey. And so because we have lots of concerns about this study, in particular that our emails are gonna get trapped in spam filters, overly aggressive spam filters, um, the first question we asked our respondents was if they could identify their representative from a list of four representatives where the other three were randomly chosen. And so here, we're, we're placing the proportion of folks who got this question correct with the small award low frequency, large award low frequency, small award high frequency, large award high frequency. And what we see is that basically everyone gets this question correct, and the folks who are in the high frequency condition get it, uh, are a little bit better at this, as we might expect, because they got five emails from their legislator. And so we again asked the participants if they could evaluate how effective their legislator is at delivering money to their constituents. Um, and so again, so we see this interesting separation. So that there's 10 times more money being claimed in this large award low frequency condition, and yet they're evaluating their legislator as substantially less effective at delivering money to the district than participants in this small award high frequency condition. This then carries over to overall evaluations. So there's 10 times more money, again, being claimed in this condition, and yet our participants are evaluating their legislator overall uh, higher in the small award high frequency condition. And even though there's 100 times the money being claimed in the large award high frequency condition, these participants aren't evaluating their legislator much more effective than the small award high frequency condition. And indeed, we, if you take the baseline of the small award low frequency condition and ask, how effective is a dollar at, at increasing the feeling thermometer rating? We find that dollars that are at, spread, up, spread out over the small award high frequency condition are 90 times uh, more effective. You get a 90 times greater per dollar return than dollars in the large award high frequency condition. Yeah. Justin, this is yeah. great. Uh, was there any like control condition that has no money but just high frequency contacts? Yeah, like, so, so like, are you worried about walked truncation by death? No, I'm worried about, it's the mere fact of the contact, right? Mm -hmm. Your legislator walked a dog today, right? right? So it's like some control condition that has the, so you see the legislator's name, but you don't know that she spent money. Mm -hmm. So we, we, um, we have this other experiment that we ran with our Facebook application where we have five messages posted to your Facebook wall, five of them are credit claiming, five are advertising, and then, and then we have a pure control condition. And there, uh, we were worried about exactly this. And, and the psychological phenomenon is called like mere exposure. And, uh, but there we find that there is a differentiation both in perceived effectiveness and in overall evaluation. So in this experiment, we didn't uh, have that condition. Yes. So I'm just wondering, I mean, it seems like if you wanted to have sort of a rational voter trying to make this decision, right, they would want to distinguish a little bit between sort of actions and outcomes because this is sort of a large collaborative body and at some level an action, I mean, you know, may not result in anything, but at least I know it's you, whereas the outcome I don't know it's you, right? So it's, it's a little bit muddier. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I'm just wondering if you were able to tease that apart at all, the, like, that contribution of what I did. So, for example, if you were to compare the results you have here with something similar for a governor or mm -hmm. like a head of one of the federal agencies and see what they get. So, so this, this is, a, I think, a big relevant question. So some of the work that um, actually Rob Van Howling has done has, um, has, has shown that legislators think that there's some divisiveness in credit at least when they're, when they're uh, allocating money in earmarks. And other folks have assumed that there's sort of no divisiveness in this credit. So there seems to actually be a controversy in the literature about how much one person's gonna receive credit for something and, and like how voters are doing this parsing. So right now we're putting two experiments in the field that are designed to, to get at exactly this. They're gonna look at not only how legislators receive credit when they're paired up with other folks, 
but also we're running an experiment to show how legislators can claim credit for the same thing over time. Because rather than being sort of this rational with this the sort of zero sumness of credit, we think that uh, credit is much less zero sum and there's the opportunity to, to, to be viewed collaboratively could actually be an, an effective uh, strategy, can actually bolster support. Well, this may be a little bit outside of the scope of this um, this experiment, but I was wondering uh, if I were running <coughs> running for an office, I would uh, I look at this thing. I, I would be wondering how about actions that are not ne necessarily measurable by by uh, money, but maybe, for example, uh, some sort of a strong belief system. For example, if you were in Montana and you would be trying to uh, advocate strong gun control legislation, you you would but uh, you would find yourself in big trouble. Then you, uh, this right. side, this side, you probably the effect would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so but that, you can't measure that as easily as you can measure money. Right. Money. Yeah. So so. So I think that, that this sort of framework, though, can speak more generally to, to why legislators do certain things. So for example, why do legislators introduce legislation that's destined to fail and destined even never to get a hearing? So it could be that this gives them the opportunity just to go home and position take. This is sort of a classic explanation in the literature. But it also allows legislators the opportunity um, when they're announcing actions, it can help explain why it is that they scream at uh, banking officials when they're on various regulatory uh, committees. So it could be that this provides them with the opportunity just to say, I screamed at this banking official even though no serious action was taken. Right? No, there's been no policy change. Right? So I, I think certainly this explanation is perhaps more general than, than what we're showing here. But OK. So we, we have this. Clear finding then that, that constituents are responding to the number of actions that are reported rather than uh, the amount of money. And we may ask, why is this the case? So in the final question in this study, we asked our participants to recall how much money their legislator claimed credit for receiving. And because this is mechanical Turk and because they're all Turkers are very paranoid about being paid, we assured them that their response to this question would not affect their compensation. Um, and so the, the responses would suggest that they believed us, at least some of them did. And so on the left-hand side here, we have the dollar amount that our participants recall their legislator claiming credit for. This is a log scale, but we're providing the actual dollar amounts on the label, so it's a little bit easier to interpret. And the, the black dots are the estimates from our Turkers, and the open circles are the truth. And what we find is that our participants are able to replicate the correct ordering so that the folks who are in the, the single message small award condition, the low frequency small award condition, thought their legislator claimed credit for the, the least amount of money, and this order is maintained across the conditions. Okay? So this would suggest that our participants lack the context, lack the amount of information to evaluate the amount of money that legislators claim credit for. That folks in this single message condition are unaware, not thinking hard enough to know that this is a lot of money, and therefore there should be a bigger response if they're evaluating money. Um, but the, you'll notice that all of these estimates are to the left of these open circles. And so this would suggest that uh, our participants are also systematically under recalling or under remembering how much money legislators claim credit for securing. And that's what this right hand plot shows. This shows the proportion of dollars that legislators claim credit for in our experiments, the proportion that are recalled. And what we see is that the lowest proportion or the most forgotten is in the large award, high frequency condition whereas the highest rate of, of recall is in the high award, um, uh, excuse me, high frequency small award condition. Right? So this would suggest that there are tallying errors as well, so that both are operating here, both are explaining this finding. And so what this suggests then is that, that constituents are providing the sorts of incentives for legislators to claim credit throughout the process and for grants. And that's because constituents are rewarding actions that are being reported rather than the money that's being delivered or the expected amount of money being delivered. And so that then brings us back to, to Visklowski to, fin to finish the talk. And so this then uh, illuminates how Visklowski is solving what we might call the representative's problem by, by actually taking it and, and seizing the opportunity so that representatives are claiming credit throughout this process and not just for checks as they're being cut in the district. But we can also see how this would complicate accountability. So it may be the case that the legislators who are claiming credit for the most actions are also the ones that are delivering the most money. 
But our experimental results would suggest that this isn't going to occur because of political pressure. If it occurs, it'll be through serendipity. It'll just be through a, a, a fortunate happenstance, right? Or at least this, account of, this relationship between legislator and constituent and holding legislators accountable for what's being delivered is a much more complicated task than perhaps previously appreciated. And we're able to show that through this political explanation of how spending builds support. So with that, I thank you and look forward to your questions. Yes. Yeah, I can, I can repeat it, too. Uh, it's fascinating work, as I said. Uh, do you think the reason the numbers are a little lower for the recall is that people are discounting uh, the claims mentally, like saying, yeah, oh. they're claiming 5,000, so I'm going to think it's 3,000? That's interesting. Um, if, if folks are doing that in a systematic way, we would expect the proportion to be identical across the, the, the press releases, right? Um, but that certainly could be the case. So we could, so, and we do see some evidence for this with the, um, uh, the how likely is it that your district's gonna receive the money. I mean, those are really low numbers. So only 50% of people at most think that their district is likely to receive the money. So it would suggest that lots of folks are distrusting of these sorts of messages, perhaps. Or just thinking or, they're exaggerating, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing I was thinking is the the numbers you had for just giving credit for trying, you know, for saying I'm gonna try. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, what are what are some of the psychological? Might there be some nice, you know, psychological explanations for that? Like, oh, this legislature is on our side. He's one of us, or she's one of us. They're trying to get stuff for us, and they're a good gal, a good guy, and that's why I like them? Do you think they're, or, or what are some of the other potential explanations for that, do you think? Yeah, yeah. so that certainly could be, be part of what uh, sort of classic personal vote literature talks about. So folks back in the 70s talked about how these provided opportunities for legislators to show that they're one of us, that they're one with the district. And that's, that certainly could be the case. Um, and so it's interesting then that there's not a subsequent bonus on top of that for actually having engaged in the request or actually having secured the money for finishing the job, because presumably we'd want to reward effectiveness as well. Presumably. Uh, I, this is, there's a lot of great work here. It's really interesting. Um, I was wondering um, if you have any thoughts on the Dan Burton problem, you know, about when claiming credit actually there's something about the strategic yeah. environment, you know, and it's a very neutral strategic environment and the experiments you use mm -hmm. and the press releases are just a, against a neutral yeah. baseline. There's no other communication. Right. Whereas in the Dan Burton environment, you know, there's a challenger yes. raising the specter of fiscal irresponsibility, which presumably is why Dan Burton was doing the optimal thing by not doing very right. much at all. Right. And, and so do you have any sense of what sort of turns off credit claiming and when, they, when it goes down, what makes it go down? Absolutely. So that's, I'm, I'm flipping to um, a, a pair of experiments that we ran. Uh, because one of the things we find with the Tea Party is that the Dan Burton experience, this, this sort of cranky challenger who alleges fiscal irresponsibility, this becomes much more prominent. So we ran a pair of studies where we injected um, budget criticism along with the, the credit claiming. So we had a legislator claim credit for spending, and then we had either the CBO provide information about the expenditure, saying, um, that this is gonna be deficit spending and to provide the total amount that would be added to the deficit. And then we also provided information from partisan officials. So in this case, we had Debbie Wasserman Schultz or Reince Priebus providing information that sort of replicates the sort of challenger information that we might see. And uh, what we find is that there's a, pr a pretty big effect. So here we just have, uh, say, the effect on approval rating for the legislator. And what we find is that there's a hit. So if you provide this budget criticism, legislators are um, evaluated lower, lower overall. But there doesn't appear to be a big difference between the CBO and the partisan information. So it's just the prevalence of this information that's, that's providing the hit. And so this then provides some context, we think, for the both dip in Republican credit claiming, and I'm sure if I have it here, and also the rise in, in Republican anti-spending rhetoric. So here we have the proportion of press releases where um, sort of anti-spending topics are being raised. And what we see is that this explodes for Republicans, not surprisingly, right around the time the Tea Party emerges. Yes, sorry. 
Uh, yes, uh, I'd just like to ask a question about uh, the, one, this last uh, point you made uh, about, like, if I'm a representative, I'm better off um, uh, claiming credit for five things that are, like, small amounts of money than one thing that's a large mm -hmm. amount of money, right? And, uh, you know, it, it's a very, very interesting point. Uh, the, uh, my, my concern with it, though, is that um, uh, w if I'm a voter and I'm assessing my representative and... Uh, you know, I see I see them uh, claiming credit for five things that are all very different. Uh, then I think you know, well, they're they're really active. They're not just mm -hmm. you know uh, giving the, or, or like helping their uh, campaign contributors. They're actually uh, you know going toward uh, yeah. working in a lot of different areas. And so uh, you can't really reduce the amount of money they spend that they, they uh, 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 they you know, they secure for their district to a one-dimensional scale because I'm thinking of it mm -hmm. in terms of, like, multi-dimension. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you rerun the experiment, uh, what I'd like to see maybe is, like, compare, uh, like, uh, a credit claiming for five, five times for something that's really similar to five times where all, each of the five things is very different and see if that has a, a big effect on, on right. it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so sort of generalizing this idea, which, which is this great point, that, that the types of things that are being claimed matter. And I think there's, there's two ways that could happen. So it could be the header, maybe, that this person is just an active person who's getting out there and doing, doing stuff. So we're, we're less concerned about that because this is representative of how this credit claiming is happening. So legislators, when they do uh, report many actions, there's a lot of heterogeneity there. So that this conflation is, we think, important and, and representative of what legislators are doing, but it does speak to the mechanism. Um, and, and, and that's something that we, we can't quite tease out with that experiment. And then in another experiment that we're running, though, it's also more generally of interest to see how the type of expenditure matters. So when I've presented this before, there was someone in the audience who really didn't like police officers and, and, and thought that our dose response study was a result of, of folks being skeptical of having a lot of money for the police in their district. Um, and so we've subsequently ran the dose response study again, and that it doesn't appear to be a police effect. But in general, it, we may expect that there's differences in the, in the recipient in the credit that legislators are allocated. So that plan, the effect of getting money for Planned Parenthood is likely to be very different than getting money for highways, which is another way to, I think, make your point. Uh, um, so. Uh, the, uh, so it's really interesting stuff, and so I have a question about the treatments when you're when they're either claiming that they did something or that they got something. So is it? Am I remembering it right now? I can't now remember for sure. Do you have? It's one or the other that they're doing. Is that right? So so that yeah, we can go back to that slide, and I can just narrate for you what happens. So they're either securing, or they're requesting, or stating their intent to request. Right. And so uh, I did think that this is interesting and it sort of came up before because it does seem like secured um, it, without the, so, so it does seem like there are two things that are happening there. One, secured you might discount for this reason that it's a product of the collectivity. So uh -huh. you could just be claiming it even though you had nothing to do with getting it. Whereas request is an individual action that you get it. You, right. You're asking for it. So you might get credit for that and this was already sort of pointed out. And so it does seem like it's interesting whether if you uh, like consciously crossed those two things, I asked for it and got it. Yeah. Uh, that you know, I sent a letter and subsequently we secured it. Right. Um, what, or, whether those are just two different routes, people are thinking about it differently because it plays into the standard stuff about credit claiming, which is, I mean, the one nice thing about secured that I think makes these claims plausible is that it's their geographic district they're getting something for, so who else would provide it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons I think people are probably giving them credit, you know, or at least yeah. would play into it. But, but I wonder if it would be, have you ever done one where you intentionally, cro you know, basically have that set of treatments? Yeah, the, uh, the, cl the closest we get to it is when we're studying the, the effect of these implications. And so we'll have legislators say they secured an expenditure, and then we include what we call a civics lesson, and one of the, the civics lessons we provide is that this legislator inserted this expenditure into an appropriations bill, uh, and subsequently it was allocated to the district. And there we find that there's not a difference. There's no increase in credit 
from saying you secured and then providing that civics lesson. So mm -hmm. we think that when, when you say secured, it looks like folks are assuming that the legislator did it because that additional information isn't bumping people around, isn't affecting. What, what if you did the, have you done one where the civics lesson is, sometimes districts get stuff because it's part of a program the legislator had nothing to do with? Uh, yeah, so, so, so kind of, let me know if this, this gets at it. So, so what we're trying to get at there is the effect of the implication when someone's saying that they announced something. And so we have uh, the legislator announced this allocation from this fire department grant and then we have the civics lesson for the announced condition uh, when, when, when that's brought up is that um, this legislator found out about this grant after it was allocated and we described the competitive grant process before that. And there, there is a huge, a huge effect so that the credit legislators receive is, is a big hit. So there, there's pretty good evidence that constituents are inferring that when you announce something, you're responsible for it. And then when we provide the information that they're not, you see that this, there's this big Detriment, detrimental effect. Interesting. Uh, I, I know in some other work you did, you, you looked at if it's a safe district or not, how that affects the outcome. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned here, in, my, in response to my earlier question, a difference with safe districts or not. But I don't, if, I, if you showed it here, I missed it. No, no I, so I, I didn't show it. So I, I either have it, uh, no, so I don't have it in these slides, and this is on my computer. Um, so I can, just, I can describe the, the patterns. And so what you see is that for both Democrats and Republicans, the marginal legislators, those who are representing districts composed of the other party's partisans, credit claim a lot. They have a lot of incentives to cultivate the personal votes. They allocate a much larger share of their, their press releases to credit claiming, and that the folks who are aligned credit claim at a, a lower rate. And so that's, that's something that I found in the Senate, and that actually is also true in the House as well. So this, this seems to be a, a pretty persistent pattern. So I had a, an ancillary question first. Was there any ethical issues in using real senators' names and claiming something that's not actually true? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, right, that we're raising it is the ethical, I mean, is an ethical issue. Um, so our IRB was very quick to approve the design, and um, so I actually like, sent an email back. I said, like, well, maybe you guys don't want to just approve it so quickly. Like, let's talk about this. Um, uh, but they, they were really not concerned, and then so I started asking around why this would be the case, and I guess our psychology department does a lot of really insane things. Uh, <laughs> and so this could be anchoring. So um, I guess at the same time I was running this study, there was someone who was informing participants that the government is systematically sterilizing certain subsets of the population. And so uh, I guess by comparison, this is uh, dandelions. Um, and so yeah, I think, I think there are real concerns here. So we debrief in a really vigorous way. So we, we, we jump up and down and we try to make as clear as possible that, that this was fictitious. Um, and, and so I think that should address those concerns. We are running these experiments on a small number of people spread throughout the country. Um, and given the rarity of extremely close elections, it's unlikely that we'll sway. So and, my and, other question was, you have this great uh, percentage of press releases that are credit claiming versus not over time. So have mm -hmm. you looked at actual support for these senators, how it varies over time and varies with the percentage of the yeah. credit claiming? So like real world, world data rather than social experiment. Yeah, so, so we have some of this. This is a really tricky thing, thing to get at because of the selection that we've described. So the marginal legislators are the ones who are credit claiming the most and these are the ones who are uh, most exposed to national tides. And so in a previous paper, what we did is we took senators and we basically matched on their approval ratings in the same state. So we took senators with basically the same approval ratings before a year and then looked at how the credit claiming rates affected subsequent approval rating. This is not a perfect design. Um, but what we found is that the legislators who are credit claiming more often are the ones who are getting uh, more support. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about targeted messaging, because when you showed those rates, it was like, this is just a press release, and the idea was sort of it goes to everyone. Yeah. But presumably, particularly for some of these Republican senators, for example, or representatives, you might imagine them saying, well, if I know the Tea Party reads this, piece, this publication and yeah. not that one, I'm only going to send the press release to the one that hits the, mar the people that aren't, don't disapprove of the action. Right. So, so a lot of these press releases are being posted to a website, so that would suggest that there's some some view of this as being sort of generally disseminated. But clearly there must be some targeted messaging going on. So example, the fire department grants, uh, there's a lot of fire department newsletters that are, that are sort of broadcasting these. And that could be particularly true with blogs as well. 
I think it would be hard to uh, generate a profile of yourself as a credit claimer in one venue and then go to another venue and, and not be perceived as a, as a credit claimer in another publication. I think, I think that would be pr pretty difficult to maintain. Thanks. Um, there's long been concern about the collective action problems that pork creates, that uh, there are members' incentives to go after all this pork will mm -hmm. result in uh, the society worse off, country worse off, and all that. And it seems yeah. like this has some really interesting implications for those, those findings, and that if you could just get all members to understand that mini pork yeah. And make them just as better off, and there'd be no potential costs or minimal potential costs to society. Anyway, so I'm just wondering if you can speculate about the broader implications yeah. of these findings, and if that's if, uh, if we're not maybe better off, because obviously you've talked about problems as well. What what could we what could we do about it, or what should we do? Yeah. Okay, so so on the on the uh, sort of classic results about. Um, about over expenditures because of pork seeking. A lot of those models actually predict that you end up with the size of expenditures that we're, we're seeing here because you're putting together these universalistic coalitions and, and because you have to spread that money out so you end up with you know, 10 or $15 million earmarks going to particular legislators. Um, so I'm not sure that this provides sort of a way out of, of uh, the sort of wine gas Shepsley type worlds. Um, is, if they're just as well off with like Twenty thousand dollar pork. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's not or, quite not yeah. quite true though, right? Yeah. So so they're yeah, yeah so it's steep like, up like to one point five. So every house member gets one point five million dollars and we're set. Um, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. So so another way to think about this too is that this actually could provide incentive for underinvestment in infrastructure. Yeah. So that like there's too little spending being targeted at the at the right things. Um, and and so what can we do to get out of this? So that's that's a great question. Uh, um, uh, I have I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So just uh, to follow up on that. Um, uh, just to follow up on that. Um, so you know, one thing you could imagine is that the amounts are much more that that there are two audiences for this pork. One is the audience you're tapping into, and the other mm -hmm. is the people who are asking for it. And if yeah. they want money to build something, and they only get a quarter of what they want. Um, they are not going to give credit uh, yeah. in the same way, and so that there's a pressure for amount that's just not captured in the. So mm -hmm. one one so so I was wondering what you think about that in general, and, and whether you could find a population to do your experiments on that would be more like the actual population. But yeah. another idea is to describe a situation where the legislator only accomplished half of the goal of the of the district's oh. request mm -hmm. you know so they asked for this and i was able to get this mm -hmm. you know is that make you you know how does that look compared to these just flat out claims i got this amount uh right. or a news report might for example say that mm -hmm. you know so the legislator offer it gets a certain amount right news report says it's only half enough to build that uh, another face on Mount Rushmore, but you know, pretty good. Right. Okay. So, um, so two parts there. So the the second part um, I'll deal with first, which is, uh, can we replicate these these conditions where we know a legislator is not going to be completely successful? And so we certainly could do that. And one of the interesting uh, things that we'd have to deal with that experiment is to separate out the disappointment effect from you only got fifty percent from an anchor anchoring effect because we are gonna anchor uh, an amount down when we say that this is the amount that was requested, and, but working with proportions may be a way to do that. We could just say that this person obtained 50% of the requested amount of money, and so that's definitely something we can, we can put in the queue of experiments. So the first is, can we find a more uh, representative population? So this is a good question, and I think it also ha speaks to how sophisticated we imagine local officials are. In, in the way they're thinking about the world. So sometimes they'll be really sophisticated because they'll be really focused on these projects. Other times, um, they'll sort of be applying for these grants or not quite monitoring what's going on with like police and fire and may just be creating the similar sorts of impressions that we're seeing the participants in our study create. So if you think about various mayors and, and their focus or their ability to, to know what's going on in every facet of city government, I think it would be pretty limited, but running these on more sophisticated populations is another great idea. 
Yeah, I had in mind, so mayors, that's one example, but the other one I think would be interest groups. Ah, so, uh -huh. so people who, and you know, you could imagine some design using like your Facebook experiment where mm -hmm. you got people to sort of say like, I want to sign this petition to ask for X amount of money. Yes. And then come back and treat them with information about how much was achieved. Uh, That's and awesome. Then, okay. And you know, it would take you yeah. a little while, and Facebook's pretty inefficient at getting people to click. But uh, yeah, Solomon works at Facebook now, so I think I think yeah, we might be able to impl yeah. But something yeah. like that, where you got people to put their own right. request down and then see. Yes. A, a yeah. So that would that would also capture the salience. So perhaps what's going on here is that there's a lot of issue publics, and you're only informed on your issue area, and so you don't know how much this money is for police, but you would know for fire or something like that, right? All right, yeah. um, I'll take, I'll abuse my prerogative and ask the last question. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think through like the general equilibrium effects of these results yeah. and it's like kind of hard, right? It's sort of, you know, as Rob was getting at, you know, there's a lot of reasons to give pork. Part is, am I gonna make some constituents directly happy? Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll co uh, contribute to me financially, uh, either right. by work or money. Uh -huh. So they really are sensitive to the amount of money I give. There's other people who may or may not like pork um, so, you know, your results are that people are very sensitive to There's got to be some cost to this because maybe it's just effort because if I'm aligned with my district, I don't do it as much, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one... Well, just, just to seize on that, it could just be that, it, that it's better to take positions. Yeah. Yeah, that, that doesn't have to be right. cost. That's, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. an opportunity. That's still yeah. a cost, an opportunity yeah, 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 okay, cost, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, but that sort of builds, you know, like on the representation dilemma, I'm not sure this helps us at all, right? It's sort of like, all right, if some movement starts that says we don't want pork, but there's people in my district that always want it. And even if people say they don't want it, if there's like, you know, if there's just some externality effect of spending the marginal dollar, I'm going to mm -hmm. get it from somewhere else. Those four models in political science to sort of figure out what the optimal level of pork is, they're not taking into account, like, say, only half Americans pay income tax, right? right yeah. <laughs> there is not, <laughs> you know, the, the fundamental part of the model is broken. You're not actually taxing and spending on the same um, population, uh, especially if you add in futures markets, right? You're taxing half the population now, a lot of it is from the future to spend now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated, you know, but, but if I get that, and then on the other hand, I can, like, stop giving these press releases, right? How do I, it's unclear that the voters have a way to, to hold legislators responsible, right? If, if I can like downplay my pork behavior by not issuing as many press releases, right. but I still get to con spend a lot of pork by borrowing from the future and half right. Americans to pay taxes, uh, and then I make certain constituents who are highly saliently paying attention right. happy, your results say, oh yeah, I got total freedom to do that. Like the short version of the question is sort of like Sean's, what's keeping them honest? Right. And, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. and his was, he was focusing on why are they not just lying, and right. my version is sort of like almost the same, except what, my version of lying is they just don't release the, the press release. And then, and then so th this is a, a definite possibility, and so we can imagine that there's some expenditures that are, are sort of for the broad public con interest, and there are other expenditures that are uh, sort of handouts for campaign contributors. And so th this latter class of expenditures is not something that we're gonna be speaking to, and something that definitely lies outside of our, our model. And um, Actually, somebody at the Washington Post has approached me about trying to study earmarks that aren't claimed in these press releases for this very reason, because we'd have good reason to think that they are a handout. But that said, even if, if, we, if we passed a regulation now that said no more credit claiming, no more ribbon cutting, right, we should still see a decrease in the amount of pork barreling, unless we think all pork barreling is being done for campaign contributors. So I do, I do think it would provide uh, some purchase on this, the representative's dilemma if I understand, understood the way you framed it. Did I? Yeah. We'll, we'll talk after. Okay, good. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.